There's a lot of zany, kooky, funny-looking villains in the world of DC Comics. For instance, the rainbow creature is a creature colored like a rainbow. They're a Batman villain that can, among other things, flatten anything, including people, into the second dimension. Another more recognizable Batman villain, Man Bat, is... well, the name's pretty self-explanatory. Is Plastique a former terrorist that can, according to her Wikipedia page, project explosive force at will by touching an object with her fingertips? Chemo is a plastic container come to life that can shoot toxic waste. And Dog Welder is a guy that welds dogs to people's faces. It just so happens that all of these villains, including many others, were contenders to be included in James Gunn's The Suicide Squad. While none of these wacky ne'er-do-wells made the cut, the large cast of villains that are featured in Gunn's movie lean pretty heavily on the side of obscurity, with the exception of one Harley Quinn. The reason more unknown villains were included instead of popular ones was, according to Gunn, because he wanted to follow John Ostrander's original vision of mostly second-rate antagonists, Ostrander being the creator of the modern iteration of the Suicide Squad. Gunn added that there's an innate, tragic element to supervillains who aren't even that good at being bad. And the movie really focuses on this tragic element, giving these second-rate villains more depth and humanity to help us empathize with them. If there's one thing James Gunn is good at, it's getting us to care about the outcast, reject characters. This is a common feature in all of his comic book movies. Typically, through the use of tragic backstories, a redeeming quality or two, and some humor, these losers that might have just been the butt of a joke in another movie are given the starring roles in Gunn's flicks. And through these flawed outcasts, we can easily see parts of ourselves in them. Being an outsider, feeling alone, feeling hopeless, that's just such a common uh, state of being for so many of us at so many different parts of our lives. Rather than watching the ideal hero be a perfect role model, following characters who are as flawed as we are makes it much easier to empathize with them. And nobody in the Suicide Squad epitomizes this kind of loser more than Abner Krill, aka Polka Dot Man. First appearing in the 300th issue of Detective Comics in 1962, Polka Dot Man, or as he used to be called, Mr. Polka Dot, used the polka dots on his costume to store a variety of weapons and tools to help him commit crimes as well as fight Batman and Robin. And then, after not appearing in anything for over 30 years, Polka Dot Man made a reappearance when he got his ass whooped by GCPD detective Harvey Bullock. After this, Polka Dot Man would only make the occasional appearance more as a background character. And it wasn't until the Final Crisis Aftermath Run comics in 2009 that it looked like he was going to be shown more prominently after he joined a group of other low-tier villains. His return didn't last very long, however, as just two issues later, Krill was killed by a flying manhole cover. The character would appear some more every now and then in the comics that took place in alternate universes and other things, like some of them LEGO games, but for the most part, Polka Dot Man was relegated to being nothing more than an embarrassing loser for damn near his entire existence, which is exactly why James Gunn included him in his Suicide Squad. When asked about why he picked Polka Dot Man over another silly character like the Condiment King, Gunn said, Polka Dot Man was a sincere character, like, Polka Dot Man came out, and I wish I could remember the creator's name, and they're like, this is a new Batman villain that we're creating named Polka Dot Man, and he was sincerely created. Condiment King is a joke. For Gunn, that sincerity in his character was imperative to getting the audience to feel for him. In another interview, Gunn said, And so I wanted to take this character and give him a soul. I think it was just about giving us this guy who was the typical loser and get to see him on his journey. In The Suicide Squad, Krill is a character who at first is treated as the biggest loser in a team of losers, but eventually, after we get to know him a little, becomes more important than even he thought he could be. When we first meet Krill, he almost acts as more of a background character. After his introduction, he kind of just lingers around, not doing or saying much other than making an occasional comment, usually played for laughs, and providing a little assistance at the end of this one fight. But as the movie goes on and he spends more time with the squad, we learn more about Krill and the story behind his peculiar powers. We realize that rather than simply being the joke character he initially came across as, Krill has much more depth behind him. He's a sad, lonely guy whose own mother treated him like a guinea pig and made him feel like a freak. We don't know the events that led to Krill's arrest, but if his comic book counterpart is any indication, it's possible that because of his situation, he felt that a life of crime was his only option. After opening up to the team, Krill starts to loosen up and becomes a little more of an active participant in the movie. This culminates in the film's climax during the fight with Starro. In what he believes to be an act of heroism, we see Krill be genuinely proud of himself after having dealt a decisive blow to Starro. He finally feels like he can be something more than a freak or a loser. Unfortunately, the sense of accomplishment doesn't last long. I'm a motherfucking super I find Krill to be a good representation of all the main characters in the Suicide Squad, 
Characters like Bloodsport and Peacemaker might seem like they're just cool action anti-heroes on the surface, but we learn that underneath, they're just as big of losers as Krill. And that goes for just about everyone. Bloodsport doesn't seem to have anybody in his life except for a daughter he can't connect with, while Peacemaker deals with feelings of insecurity. He's very socially awkward. Something as simple as the uniform hits on the head that this guy has validation problems. This is a guy who wears a large fucking chrome helmet. Everything is red, white, blue, and yellow. Krill's arc in the movie also kind of mirrors Bloodsport's. In the beginning, Mr. Sport is closed off and doesn't care about too many people, but by the end of the movie, his humanity shines through his initial cold demeanor after he connects with Ratcatcher 2 and selflessly chooses to save others by fighting Starro. Both Bloodsport and Polka Dot Man wind up going on their own journeys of self-improvement. Looking at some of Gunn's other movies, we can see a clear trend of them featuring similarly broken characters. I look around at us, you know what I see? Losers. Throughout the Guardians of the Galaxy movies, Rocket, being the most tragic character in the group, learns that even after everything he's been through and what he's done, he still can and deserves to be loved. It's the most emotional arc in the trilogy and it definitely hits a bit harder than Polka Dot Man's, but both are about discovering one's self-worth. There's this lesser known movie from 2010 that Gunn wrote and directed called Super. It stars Dwight Schrute as a vigilante who fights crime and tries to rescue his wife from Kevin Bacon. In terms of tone, Super feels almost like a prototype Suicide Squad. It's graphic, gory, and in typical gun fashion, pretty wacky. And just like Polka Dot Man and Rocket, Super's protagonist, Frank Darbo, is a pretty big loser. He, however, is not quite as likable or sympathetic as they are. It's easy to feel bad for him in the beginning, but as the movie goes on and he starts acting questionably, it becomes more of a challenge to root for him. Darbo's a guy who wants to be a hero and help others, but is terribly misguided, which leads to him doing some pretty nasty stuff. But like Polka Dot Man and Rocket, Darbo's arc ends in a more hopeful manner. After spending a good chunk of the movie brutalizing and eventually killing others, Darbo's journey ends with him ultimately alone, save for a pet rabbit. He realizes and accepts that he isn't a real hero, but finds a new purpose in believing that he was able to provide his ex-wife's children with a chance to hopefully go on to change the world for the better instead of him. It's a fitting end to Darbo's arc. He didn't deserve a happy ending given his actions throughout the movie, but he's able to reflect on his mistakes and hopefully start changing for the better. You know, most of us in the world probably relate a lot more to Polka Dot Man than we do Captain America. I think when watching characters like Captain America or Superman, superheroes that can pretty much do no wrong can be entertaining. It's gratifying watching these paragons of virtue conquer any obstacle that comes their way. It can provide a fun escape from the things we don't have power over in our lives. However, these kinds of heroes aren't as easily relatable. Sure, writers will give them some more normal human problems to deal with, like affairs of the heart. But those kinds of superheroes don't usually deal with things like depression or low self-esteem. Steve Rogers' indomitable will that lets him always get back up no matter the circumstance is inspiring. But I think what makes a character like Polka Dot Man just as appealing, if not a little more, is akin to the reason we love underdogs so much. Seeing an outcast, a loser, a nobody, who deals with feelings like worthlessness and loneliness, rise to the occasion and ultimately prove that they do have value, is so satisfying to see. What I find inspiring about Gun's losers is that they're able to change. Even though they may feel like a freak, or that they're worthless, or that they don't deserve to be loved, they're able to deal with their issues. They're able to better themselves. They're able to realize their worth. In Gun's world, even the bottom of the barrel, second-rate Dollar Tree villains can become more than their archetype and prove that their existence means something. That even the life of a loser has value.